Hello everyone and welcome. I am the Congressman and today we're going to be talking about streets, specifically street names, and even more specifically the downtown streets in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. The year was 1829, and a man called James Doty purchased 1,200 acres of land on an isthmus between Lakes Monona and Mendota. At the time, this was part of the Michigan Territory, but when Michigan applied for statehood in 1836, the Wisconsin Territory was formed, and it needed a capital. James Doty wanted his new city to be that capital, which was admittedly a pretty bold idea, considering barely anybody lived there, and it didn't even have a name yet. But, conveniently, former President James Madison died June 28, 1836, so Doty named his city Madison. There's probably an alternate timeline where Madison doesn't die in 1836, and so nowadays the capital of Wisconsin is like Dotyville or Dotyland or Doty Town. I like Dotyville. Also, quick side note, so you know how former presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence? You know. Anyway, James Monroe died July 4th, 1831, exactly five years later. So, here we are, 1836, James Madison dies June 28th. He couldn't hold on for six more days? I mean, that would have been neat, right? And then, like, five more years later, it's 1841, we're approaching July 4th. Everybody's going to keep a real close eye on John Quincy Adams. Anyway, what was I talking about? Right, streets! So, Madison, Wisconsin was a real city now. Sort of. I mean, it had a name, had a few dozen people, and uh, a founder, this guy, who wanted it to be the new capital. But James Doty knew that his city needed something else, something to, to catch people's attention, really set it apart. And that's when it hit him the streets. Just like he named the city itself after a founding father, he could name the streets after founding fathers, too. It was brilliant. I mean, the streets didn't exist yet, but that's okay. He didn't need real streets, he just needed a map of the streets. So he sat down and designed this grid, and named all of the streets after men who had signed the Constitution. And they were Gunning Bedford Jr., John Blair, David Brearley, now, his name was actually spelled with an E-Y at the end, but this was a fairly common misspelling, so we'll give Doty a pass on this one. There's another one coming up that's, um, a bit more intentional. Jacob Broom. John Dickinson. Benjamin Franklin. Nathaniel Gorham. Alexander Hamilton. John Hancock. James McHenry. So, Doty went with just Henry Street for this one. None of the sources I used for this video specified a reason for the change, but it's not too hard to hazard a guess. See, James McHenry originally came from Ireland. James Doty was naming these streets in 1836. Irish immigration, 1830s... Not that hard to figure it out. Jared Ingersoll. Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer. This was actually his full real name. His whole family, going forward and backward multiple generations, is full of lines like this, where you have two male siblings, and one of them is called Daniel, and the other one is Daniel of St. Thomas. It's like Daniel was the only name they knew. Imagine trying to get somebody's attention at the family reunion. William Livingston. Thomas Mifflin. He was a devout Quaker whose name is now synonymous with an annual block party. So, that's neat. James Wilson. And finally, George Washington, who got the main primary street, because of course he did. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, this is all really interesting and everything. Thanks, I thought so too. But what in the world does it have to do with Congress? Well, so far, nothing. But. That's where the remaining names come in. See, of all the men in this picture that James Doty used to name his streets, 16 of them went on to serve as senators or representatives in the new nation's Congress once it got up and running in 1789. So, let's talk about him. Abraham Baldwin was a founder of the University of Georgia. 
He was a representative from 1789 to 1799, and a senator from 1799 till he died in office in 1807. He also has a street named after him in Athens, Georgia, right near the stadium of the Georgia Bulldogs football team. In fact, some stories have said that the reason Georgia's mascot is the Bulldogs is a tribute to Baldwin, who had attended Yale, whose teams are the Bulldogs. Richard Bassett was a lawyer from Delaware who served as a senator from 1789 to 1793. He was the governor of Delaware from 1799 to 1801. And he was the grandfather of future senators Richard H. Bayard and James A. Bayard Jr. That's all I got for him. Uh, not all these guys are interesting. William Blount was one of Tennessee's first senators, but only served a little under a year between 1796 and 1797 before becoming the first person to be expelled from Congress and very nearly the first person to be impeached. There's a difference. So I'll try to make this brief. When the new nation was formed, President Washington named William Blount to be governor of the Southwest Territory, which was the area left behind after North Carolina became a state. After six years of territorial status, this area formed into the state of Tennessee. And when that happened, William Blount was elected to be one of its first senators. Two hours later. He and his brothers were dabbling in land speculation. And when I say dabbling, I mean diving cannonball style into the deep end. By some accounts, they had accumulated up to two million acres by 1795. Well, like all bubbles, this one eventually burst, and Blount could only watch helplessly while the value of his land plummeted. Now, to make matters worse, he was afraid that the French would take control of Louisiana and... Well, actually, hold on. You see, France didn't actually control Louisiana at this point. Right now, it was Spanish territory. France was currently in a war with Spain called the War of the Pyrenees, but don't worry about it. Doesn't matter to our story. So Blount was afraid that France would take control of Louisiana and cut off American access to the Mississippi River, which would totally destroy the remaining value of his western lands. So he hooked up with a few other guys and tried to join up with the British to start a war against France for control of the region. His downfall was that he put all this information in a letter, and that letter fell into the wrong hands, which made its way up the chain and landed on the desk of President John Adams, who sent it to the Senate. There, the letter was read aloud while Blount was out for a walk. He came back to hear it and was stunned. After much hand-wringing and gnashing of teeth and even some fisticuffs, Blount was immediately expelled from the Senate and the House voted to hold an impeachment trial. Ultimately, the impeachment vote failed, but Blount was already gone anyway. He didn't even attend the trial. But his legacy does live on today with his street in Madison, Wisconsin. Pierce Butler was a two-time senator from South Carolina, serving from 1789 to 1796, and again from 1802 to 1804. He was also a real piece of work. Let us count the ways. One, he introduced the Fugitive Slave Clause into the Constitution. Two, the reason that the Three-Fifths Compromise was called a compromise was because Butler was arguing strongly in favor of counting all the slaves fully in order to increase Southern representation and give them an even more disproportionate amount of power. Three, he let Aaron Burr hide out at his place while Burr was on the run after shooting and killing Alexander Hamilton. And four, he disinherited his only son for marrying a French woman. I guess what I'm saying is, fuck Pierce Butler. Daniel Carroll was a representative from Maryland from 1789 to 1791. That's about all I got on him. Uh, his cousin Charles Carroll signed the Declaration of Independence, which is kind of a neat coincidence. And, uh, oh, speaking of cousins, his wife was his first cousin. Don't look so grossed out. That was totally normal back then. Anyway, let's just move on. Jonathan Dayton was a representative from New Jersey from 1791 to 1799, including a four-year stretch as Speaker of the House. He was also a senator from 1799 to 1805. So this is another story of land speculation, conspiracy, intrigue. Okay, not so much, but Dayton was super into land speculation. He had about 250,000 acres in what would eventually become the state of Ohio. They even named a city after him there. But in 1807, when Aaron Burr's treason conspiracy was uncovered, they determined that Dayton had been giving Burr money, which Burr used to advance his plans. Dayton was actually arrested, but a grand jury decided that he didn't know what Burr was doing, and he wasn't involved in the plot. But in the eyes of the public, he was guilty by association, and his national political career was over. But he has one of the longest streets in Madison, so there's that. William Few was a senator from Georgia from 1789 to 1793. He also had a lot of jobs over the course of his life. You could even say, more than a few. Ooh. Anyway, 
He was a soldier, a Georgia legislator, a surveyor, a delegate to the Continental Congress, and then the Constitutional Convention. He was a judge. He helped Abraham Baldwin set up the University of Georgia. He moved to New York and became president of Citibank of New York, which still exists today as Citigroup. He was a New York legislator, a city alderman. He was New York's inspector of prisons for eight years, and finally, the United States Commissioner of Loans. Whatever that is. Nicholas Gilman was a representative from 1789 to 1797. He was also a senator from 1805 until he died in office in 1814. I'm sorry, it's another one that's just not all that interesting, so let's just keep going. William S. Johnson was a senator from Connecticut from 1789 until his resignation in 1791. He was also the president of Columbia University from 1787 to 1800. So his was a pretty unique case in that William S. Johnson actually opposed independence almost all the way through the entire war. See, at the beginning, there were a lot of guys who were like, we don't want to have a war. Independence is a bit too far. We could settle this stuff peacefully. But once the war was on, all those people became full-throated, independence-minded, freedom-loving patriots. But not Johnson. See, he had lived in England, he had gone to school in England, he maintained a lot of business contacts in England, and he did not want independence. After Lexington and Concord, he even personally visited British General Thomas Gage to try to hammer things out himself. Got him arrested for communicating with the enemy, but the charges were dropped, so it's all good. After the war, though, with independence now achieved, Johnson decided he was super into the idea of being a part of the new government. He attended the Constitutional Convention. He gave a ton of speeches and had a ton of ideas. Later, he was a U.S. Senator, where he gave a ton of speeches and had a ton of ideas. He even became president of what we now know as Columbia University, where I assume he gave a ton of speeches and had a ton of ideas. He actually resigned from the Senate when the National Capitol moved briefly from New York to Philadelphia because he didn't want to be away from his precious Columbia. Rufus King was a senator from New York from 1789 to 1796, and again from 1813 to 1825. He was also the minister to the United Kingdom from 1796 to 1803, and again from 1825 to 1826. King was also the vice presidential candidate on the Federalist Party ticket with Charles Coatsworth Pinckney in 1804, where they got hammered by Thomas Jefferson, and again in 1808, when they got hammered by James Madison. Then, in 1816, his big moment finally came. Rufus King was a major party's candidate for president. Unfortunately, it was the Federalist Party. They got absolutely creamed by James Monroe, and the Federalists never fielded a presidential candidate again. John Langdon was a senator from New Hampshire from 1789 to 1801. He was also the governor of New Hampshire from 1805 to 1809, and again from 1810 to 1812. And, before New Hampshire was a state, he was the president of New Hampshire from 85 to 86 and 88 to 89. Now, just like everybody else in that picture, John Langdon was a rich guy. But unlike the doctors and lawyers and plantation owners that make up the rest of this list, Langdon's racket was shipping, trading merchandise between the Caribbean and New England and London. Yes, he and his brothers made an awful lot of money. You might even say, a boatload. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'll see myself out. Cancel. William Patterson was a senator from New Jersey from 1789 to 1790. He was governor of New Jersey from 1790 to 1793, and he was a Supreme Court justice from 1793 until he died in 1806. So really, the main thing that came out of the first Congress from 1789 to 1791 was the Judiciary Act of 1789, and William Patterson basically wrote it himself. Like, literally, the document is in his handwriting. Also, Patterson has the distinction of being the first senator to resign, which he did in 1790 after being elected governor of New Jersey. Charles Pinckney, and also Charles Pinckney. So Pinckney Street is interesting because it's actually named after two different Charles Pinckneys, regular Charles Pinckney and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. Now, regular Charles Pinckney was twice the governor of South Carolina. He was a senator from South Carolina. He was minister to Great Britain. He was governor again. And finally, a representative from South Carolina. This one, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, was minister to France, where, along with Eldridge Gary and John Marshall, they formed the American side of the XYZ affair. He was also the failed Federalist presidential candidate in 1804 and 1808. I think they ran the wrong Charles Pinckney. Roger Sherman was a representative from Connecticut from 1789 to 1791, and a senator from Connecticut from 1791 until his death in 1793.
Sherman was one of the oldest founding fathers, so naturally his career in the new Congress was pretty short. But he does have a statue in Washington. All you gotta do is go to the Jefferson Memorial, zoom in with your eyes, and look up. There he is! Richard Dobbs Spate was governor of North Carolina from 1792 to 1795, and a representative from North Carolina from 1798 until 1801. He's also noteworthy for two things. Number one, this painting I keep showing you, it's called Scene at the Signing of the Constitution of the United States. It was painted by Howard Chandler Christie in 1940, and our boy Richard Dobbs Spade is the man actually signing the Constitution. Number two, his story ends in a duel. And not just any duel. He was actually shot and killed by a sitting United States Senator called John Stanley. In fact, Stanley was the man who had beaten Spate in the 1800 election. As a result of the duel, Stanley, again a sitting United States Senator, was arrested, but eventually he was pardoned by the governor of North Carolina, Benjamin Williams. In the aftermath of the duel, North Carolina did pass a law prohibiting duelists from holding public office. So there's that. Also, duels are going to be kind of a recurring theme on this channel, so yeah. And finally, Hugh Williamson, who was a representative from North Carolina from 1790 to 1793. This man was all over the map, literally. First, he attended school at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also later taught mathematics. He attended more school in Scotland and the Netherlands, where he got a medical degree. He bounced back and forth between the colonies in England and the colonies in England. He witnessed the Boston Tea Party, and when he got back to England again, he actually had to testify before Parliament as to just what the hell was going on over there. He impressed a lot of people with his testimony, so he made a lot of friends. So here he is, he's bouncing around in his academic circles by day. He's talking about astronomy and biology and mathematics and all that cool stuff. But at night, he was actually printing pro-independence pamphlets. Upon the actual Declaration of Independence, he bounced right back to the colonies, where he used his powers of medicine to help the army. He introduced the concept of preventative care to prevent disease outbreaks. He talked about this crazy thing called inoculation. In fact, he was so good at ingratiating himself into pretty much any group of people, combined with his time in America and England, at different times, different groups accused him of both spying on Benjamin Franklin for the British and spying on the British for Benjamin Franklin. I can only hope to be that cool. And that was it. James Doty had all of his streets named and his downtown design. And you know something? It worked. Madison became the territorial capital. It's more likely that Madison was picked as the capital because of its central location between the growing city of Milwaukee, the trading outposts of Prairie du Chien and Green Bay, and the large mining communities in the southwest part of the state. Also, James Doty had visited the territorial legislature with a whole shipment of buffalo fur coats for the guys because they were very cold, so that probably helped too. But it's fun to think that the naming scheme played a part, right? Anyway. But whatever the reason, Madison was now the capital. In 1841, James Doty was appointed territorial governor by President Tyler, and when Wisconsin became a state in 1848, Doty was elected as one of its first representatives. Later, he retired to his home in the Green Bay area, where he stayed until President Lincoln pulled him out of retirement and sent him to Utah to be the territorial governor out there. Doty helped avoid a war with the Mormons and, just like Lincoln, died in office in 1865. So that's all for today's show. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe and comment and you know the drill by now, right? Anyway, I am the Congressman and I will see you next time.